In an ideal world, all war crimes would be investigated and prosecution cases developed as quickly as this one. But we don't live in that world. How many Palestinian children's lives have been ruined and traumatized by Israel and the West Bank and Gaza? How many Yemeni children have been orphaned and starved? These are war crimes too, but naming them in here makes you a voice in the wilderness. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and I'm here today with the fourth installment of the Monthly Daily for the month of April. And this time Claire Daly is speaking especially a lot about consistency in the European Parliament, that you cannot apply a rule only once, but then just close your eyes of exactly similar cases in, uh, in other places. And there's also one a video that was missing from the EU Parliament Library, and I will read that at the, at the end, but please uh, enjoy the first part first. Thanks, President. Month after month, people come in here and shout glory to Ukraine. The walls and the buildings are decked with flags and slogans, stand with Ukraine. But what does that mean? What does it mean for the thousands of young male Ukrainian university students who are banned from traveling abroad to study? Since last September, although enrolled in foreign colleges, they are forbidden from leaving their country, losing places, cut scholarships, grants, in flagrant breach of Article 26 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And be clear, these men are not fleeing the war. They are exempt from military service. Proud Ukrainians, they want to play a part in redeveloping their country and rebuilding it after their education. Yet they are being blocked by Ukraine's Minister for Science and Education, who's failed to amend the law while issuing exit letters for the sons of the connected and the privileged. They're being interned by Zelensky, who despite receiving a petition from 25,000 parents and students requiring to him to act, has done nothing. And neither have the so-called friends of Ukraine in the EU government. Surely standing with Ukraine, if it's to mean anything, means standing with the citizens and against corruption. Speaker is Mr Dino Thanks very much, President. Um, we're obviously talking here about closer cooperation between the EU and the Council of Europe, and that's something that I very much support. Paragraph 35 in particular talks about the whole area of media freedom. But whereas the Council of Europe has been loud and consistent on the case of Julian Assange, for example, the European Union has been silent. And I think this is absolutely scandalous. Three years ago, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe passed a resolution declaring that the detention and prosecution of Julian Assange set a dangerous precedent for all journalists. They called for his release. 37 representatives issued a declaration that the Assange case threatens the Council of Europe's standards on the protection of journalistic sources, the rights of journalists and freedom of expression. And Commissioner Mijatovic called on the UK not to extradite Assange on the basis that it would have a chilling effect on media freedom and hamper the uh, activities of the press. If this report is to mean anything, we should follow the example of our counterparts, put ourselves on the right side of history and call for the release of Julian Assange. Thanks, President. Um, supposedly, the goals of our civilian security and defence policy include conflict resolution, crisis management, disarmament, all very essential to the security of people and communities internationally. But, of course, that's not actually what we're doing at all. We're using these issues as a cover to advance our interests in these areas. There are, of course, positive elements in the report, but unfortunately they're swamped by talks about geopolitical conflict with our strategic competitors. They double down on the failure of the security sector reform model, which has led to disasters in Mali and the broader Sahel. We talk about migration of human beings as a security threat. We call for increases in defence spending, blurring the boundaries between civilian and military policy, calling for closer cooperation with NATO and using development aid as leverage over other countries. We reject all of this. Civilian missions shouldn't be about our advancement. They should be about maintaining international peace and security and addressing the needs of affected populations. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, our colleague Mick uh, Wallace. <clears throat> Thanks again, President. 
The idea of civilian SDP should be a positive endeavour. Conflict resolution, disarmament and crisis management are deeply important today. Yet the report before us is committed to a, a militaristic framing of these practices that undermines the pretense that there is very much strictly civilian about civilian CSDP at all. The report stresses that the increased presence of strategic competitors in operational theatres necessitates more effective civilian CSDP better able to adapt to new challenges. The report characterises migration as a security threat, calls for increased in defence spending, civil military cooperation and closer cooperation with NATO, God help us. The EU maintains an economic stranglehold and systems of exploitation over many of the places where these missions are active. As long as we ignore these structural barriers to peace, view all problems through a militaristic lens and learn no lessons from the many disastrous wars we've taken part in, we'll do very little to advance peace or stability in these regions surrounding Europe. Thanks, President. Uh, since December, 69 Peruvians have died as a result of police repression. Most of them indigenous peoples, Amaras and Quechas. Thousands have been injured, some mutilated and disabled for life. And this repression, as we know, is taking place under the illegitimate presidency of Dina Bolarte, who was imposed following the effective coup against Pedro Castillo, who is currently in prison. Castillo, of course, was elected on the promise of radical change in Peru, the rejection of neoliberal policies that have promoted national plunder and served the interests of multinationals. The revenge of the Conservatives has been bloody, and it has particularly affected the poor and the rural indigenous populations of the South. These are the same regions which have been plagued by structural racism for decades, are impoverished and made more precarious by the consequences of neoliberalism. Isn't it about time that the EU, the so-called promoter of values, take off the blinker, speak up, speak out against the violation of international law and human rights taking place in that country? Thanks, President. All war is criminal and children its most innocent of victims. Exaggeration isn't necessary. Even one case of the mistreatment of children is deadly serious. The UN, which deals only in facts, has verified that 16,000 children have been horribly mistreated and concludes that this amounts to a war crime. In an ideal world, all war crimes would be investigated and prosecution cases developed as quickly as this one. But we don't live in that world. How many Palestinian children's lives have been ruined and traumatized by Israel and the West Bank and Gaza? How many Yemeni children have been orphaned and starved? These are war crimes too, but naming them in here makes you a voice in the wilderness. Of course, the rank hypocrisy of the West is no justification for Russia's violation of the rights of thousands of innocent children and their families. And neither do Russian crimes justify ours. The inconsistent application of justice is not justice. It just erodes the rule of law and makes might being right. There's been a lot of triumphalism about the ICC warrant. But there's zero chance of that being served. Russia, like the US, isn't a party to the Rome Statute. There's going to be no justice from that for the victim. The only way we can help the victims of this war is to use all our strength to bring it to an end and allow these innocent victims rebuild their destroyed lives. Beyond the human devastation from war, the annihilation of cultural wealth through looting and the export really completes the tragedy and represents a crime really against humanity's history. I remember being in Babylon and meeting the guardian of that ancient site whose father and father before him had been there and he told the story of how he spoke out against the theft of artefacts by US soldiers who were stationed there and the response was to kidnap him and take him for a period of time as a result of that. In 2021, 17,000 objects were returned to Iraq by the United States, which was welcome, but it represents a massive or a, a small amount of the massive theft of archaeological 
objects belonging to Iraq which were stolen over the years of conflict. We've seen something similar in Syria with the dark web full of Christian artifacts and other examples of Syrian history. This is all of our uh, history and it's really important that we do everything we can to protect it. Now, the following is the video that is missing in the library of the EU Parliament. The text is there, uh, you can see it here, but the video itself is not in, the, not in the library, unfortunately, and I think this text is particularly important, so I will read it to you. In Ireland, we voted down the Nice and Lisbon treaties because we didn't want an EU army. We were promised that there were no plans for one. Those promises were lies. And if you want proof, you only have to read the so-called rapid deployment capacity, which of course is not an EU army. It's just a permanently available standing multinational modular EU force, including land, air, maritime components funded out of an EU budget under the full command and control of a permanently active EU headquarters, synchronized and aligned in the framework of NATO. It's going to be there for collective defense cap capable of rapidly deploying into future battlefields outside the Union to protect the Union's values and interests, including non-permissive environments, which, as Joseph Borrell made clear, means boots on the ground and combat operations in countries where we are not welcome. Then have the procurement, the logistics and all the rest of it. Now I ask you. If that isn't an EU army, what in God's name is? Yeah, the EU is thinking about creating their own army. Wonderful. Uh, and there's only so few who actually call that out. Thank you, Claire.